Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. To the breaking news overseas, what's being called the deadliest attack on Israeli citizens since October 7th. At least 11 children and teenagers killed after a rocket strike on a soccer field in Israeli-controlled Golan Heights. Israel blaming the militant group Hezbollah, vowing retaliation. Five of those victims, uh, it, all teenagers inside that hospital behind me with serious injuries and in what's been the deadliest day here in Israel since the October 7th attacks. This video is the moment the IDF says an Iranian-made Hezbollah rocket landing near a soccer field in a Druze community in the Golan Heights, killing at least 12 people there, with most being children, injuring dozens more. Hezbollah, however, denying responsibility for the attack. It immediately spiked tensions at the northern border with Lebanon, where the IDF and Hezbollah have been trading fire daily. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu currently flying back to Israel after a trip to the U.S. This, as fighting in Gaza, of course, continues. Starting with a Fox News alert, Israel striking back at Hezbollah after the Iranian-backed terror group launched the deadliest attack on the Jewish state since October 7th on Saturday. Trey Yingst, our colleague, joins us live from that Israeli town hit by the attack. Trey, thanks for joining us. Yeah, hey guys, good morning. Right now we are in the Jeruz community of Majd al-Shams in the Golan Heights at the site of that rocket attack that took the lives of 12 young people just yesterday. I want to show you the scene here, a scene of pure devastation. We arrived this morning as funerals were taking place, a small community mourning the loss of these young lives. There were scooters here and bicycles. Kids were playing soccer when a Hezbollah rocket slammed into this field. You can see the impact site right here. To describe what took place here is to describe a massacre. We spoke with a doctor during the funeral who was one of the first responders to this attack yesterday, and he said he desperately tried to save a 10-year-old boy who was covered in shrapnel wounds, and he was unsuccessful. We spoke with a father whose young daughter was killed in the explosion, this rocket attack launched by Hezbollah yesterday. And speaking with this father, I asked him how he found out that she was killed, and he said he tried to call her again and again in the phone was busy and he arrived here at this field and his 10 year old was lying dead here among so many other children. It gives you a sense of just how violent and catastrophic these events are. And as we speak, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is preparing to convene the Israeli cabinet. We expect a major Israeli response to the Iran-backed group Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Officials speaking with Fox News overnight say they are preparing for what could be days and days of cross-border exchanges. This is very much a turning point in the ongoing conflict that started between Israel and Hezbollah on October 8th, just one day after the October 7th massacre. You talk about how this could spark a wider war. That is the major concern. And, you know, we say that Israel is fighting a one-front war right now. That's not really true. Hezbollah in the northern border has always been an issue. But there is concern that things could escalate. How much concern is there in Israel, and what does that mean for, for us here in the United States? 
there is major concern about the possibility of a broader war between Israel and Hezbollah. Already over the past several months, Hezbollah has fired thousands of rockets into northern Israel, but they've stopped short of targeting major cities like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. If the Israelis go on the offensive tonight and strike targets around Beirut or other Hezbollah strongholds, it could be another step up on the escalation ladder, but they are really left with what officials here on the ground tell us is no other choice but to respond following the tragic attack that took the lives of 12 young people. Trey, what can you tell us about these uh, early, um, resp the early response from the IDF into Lebanon? Is it, has that been uh, fairly limited and do you expect more? Absolutely. We understand that what you saw overnight, some of the artillery activity along the border between northern Israel and southern Lebanon, along with some of the airstrikes that continue to take place even at this hour, this is not even the initial response by the Israelis against right. Hezbollah. This is simply the ongoing, really, back and forth that we have seen along the border here over the past 10 months. There will be a significant response a direct response to the attack that killed these 12 innocent people yesterday. And we do expect that to happen following the cabinet meeting, likely in the nighttime hours mm. with Israeli jets in the skies of Lebanon. Just to be clear on something you said a minute ago, um, this, the, the rocket was manufactured in Iran? Yes, it is an, an Iranian rocket. And it also speaks to the issue that the Israelis are dealing with because the Iranians still to this day are smuggling rockets and missiles and right. precision guided components into southern Lebanon that are now being used against the Israelis. They have a very sophisticated ballistic missile uh, uh, arsenal. All, all of their military hardware is again supplied by Iran. We know that Iran has perfected their uh, killer drones. They've given them to Russia to use against Ukrainian civilians. Um, and, and so not only are they much more equipped from a military perspective, from military hardware, from ballistic missiles, their army is much bigger. They have the capability, Guy Benson, Hezbollah does, to overwhelm Iron Dome and Israeli defense forces. Why does all of this matter to the United States? Well, despite what President Biden said earlier this week, how he claimed we were not, our military wasn't at war, our U.S. Navy guy has seen more action in the Red Sea than any other time since World War II. So when you look at what's actually going on in the Middle East, it is a chaotic period of time. Um, it, it's even worse than chaos. It's all out war in the Middle East. Uh, we may not have called it that. Congress may not have called it that. Uh, but we are at war every single day. And if, if Lebanon, if, if Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon, and Israel get into a full war because of what Hezbollah did yesterday, it's almost impossible for the U.S. Not not to get dragged in this because we're already dragged into it, right? We're already getting hit, uh, we're already get aimed at by the Houthis. Oh my God. Seven near simultaneous strikes in multiple locations across southern Lebanon. Israel said it targeted Hezbollah's weapons depots and infrastructure. A message, but not the response promised by Israel for the rocket attack that killed civilians in the Israeli-controlled Syrian-occupied Golan Heights late on Saturday. A terrible tragedy. Innocent boys and girls. It breaks your heart. And I tell you, Hezbollah is responsible for this, and they will pay the price. <laughs> Hezbollah denied carrying out the strike. But Israel is unconvinced, saying the mass casualty incident was the most significant event since October 7. The response is not expected to happen before Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu returns home after cutting short his visit to the United States. Since I was informed of the disaster, I have been holding continuous security consultations and I have decided to bring forward our return to Israel. I will immediately enter the security cabinet upon my arrival. I can say that the state of Israel will not get over this in silence. Hezbollah and Israel have been largely calibrating their attacks in the past 10 months to prevent what is a largely limited confrontation from expanding. Israel's response will determine the trajectory of this conflict. Will it stick to the unwritten rules of engagement and focus on military targets? Will Hezbollah be able to absorb the strike without the need to retaliate, further escalating the war of attrition? The conflict between longtime enemies has reached a tipping point. 
a dangerous one. Israel and Hezbollah, they've been exchanging fire since that October attack, and this strike only adding to the fears of a possible wider war. That's exactly right, and Netanyahu has already said that Hezbollah will, quote, pay a heavy price it has not paid before. Now, what that means exactly remains unclear, but the fact that we're even posing the question of all-out war shows you how serious this attack is and the gravity of Israel's looming response. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word, Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. Tonight, with a desperate race to contain a massive wildfire raging in Northern California, exploding to more than 500 square miles, that's larger than the city of Los Angeles, scorching 5,000 acres per hour. The fast-moving wildfire doubling in size over the last 24 hours, consuming more than 130 homes and threatening thousands more. More than 2,000 firefighters battling to control the flames, thousands of people forced to evacuate their homes. The park fire prompting California's governor to declare a state of emergency in two counties. The flames also threatening the town of Paradise, now under an evacuation warning. You might remember that neighborhood was destroyed six years ago during the deadly camp fire, one of the worst in state history. Tonight, this massive blaze burning out of control in Northern California. The park fire exploding to more than 500 square miles, an area bigger than Los Angeles. There was just a perfect wave of everything coming together to make aggressive fire behavior from the slope, the terrain, topography. Thousands of firefighters are working around the clock. What authorities say started as a suspected arson is now 0% contained. Scorching 5,000 acres an hour, fueled by bone dry conditions, gusty winds, and the hottest summer on record. More than 130 homes torched and thousands more threatened. This fire has consumed everything in its path, including what's left of this house. The fireplace, the only thing left standing, and in the kitchen, it's still smoldering. Jen Robbins and her daughter had to leave their farm and animals behind. These pictures show just how close the flames came as they escaped through a tunnel of fire. The heat melting tires. So this is dragging down the highway yeah. as you guys are trying to race out. Yeah. I don't know how I was able to drive here, but I was shaking so hard and just crying. Um, when I arrived here, um, I just got out of the vehicle and collapsed and was throwing up. We already have PTSD from the campfire. Six years ago, Robbins lost everything, her home and pets, and the campfire in nearby Paradise. This new park fire is already more than twice as big and is threatening Paradise all over again. Robbins doesn't know if anything will be left of the life she had just rebuilt. Not only if the home we built is existing, 
not knowing if my livelihood of these farm animals, um, if they're even alive, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of pain. Tonight, so many here are waiting for word, fearing they'll have to start all over again. A towering, swirling fire NATO seen crossing this road. This home, among more than 130 structures, so far destroyed, and at least 4,000 more are threatened. Overnight, new evacuations in multiple communities. The fire department was like, you guys have to get out now. It's coming up and it's coming fast. Right now, the West is besieged by fire, with more than 110 active fires covering nearly 3,000 square miles. In Idaho, harrowing video shows residents escaping through a tunnel of flames. In eastern Oregon, the pilot of an air tanker was found dead, battling one of several fires consuming the state. I've lived here all my life and never, never seen it this way. Never. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It's not just the U.S. that's on fire. In Canada, 926 active fires are now burning. Fast-moving flames have devastated the town of Jasper, Alberta, and its beautiful national park. The latest images from inside this treasured town in the Rockies are a stark contrast to the stunningly beautiful scenes Jasper is known for. About 30% of the buildings here were reduced to ash. This is 67 years. Jasper's mayor, Richard Ireland, grew up in this home and lived there until he was forced to evacuate. He's one of the first to view the destruction with Alberta's premier, Danielle Smith. Billowing smoke over the town of Jasper, located in Alberta's scenic Jasper National Park, where a huge wildfire, partly caused by lightning, has forced thousands of tourists and residents to evacuate. Although those of us who experience Jasper as visitors can't imagine what it feels like to be a Jasperite right now, <clears throat> We share the sense of loss with all of those who live in the town, who care for it, and who have helped build it. On Friday, authorities said that around a third of the Western Canadian tourist town had been destroyed by the blaze. The Western provinces of Alberta and British Columbia have been hit by tens of thousands of lightning strikes in the past week, triggering new fires after a three-week heat wave. Hundreds of wildfires have been burning in the region and dozens of evacuation orders have been issued. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Risking it all for new faith in Christ. Worldwide, Muslims who leave their faith are considered apostates. And according to the Quran, they must be killed if they refuse to return to Islam. Regardless of the danger, our next guest contends Iranian officials report so many Muslims are now coming to Christ in Iran, they've been forced to shut down 50,000 of 75,000 mosques. Here with more is Don Schenk. He's executive director of the Tide Ministry. Don, this is incredible. If true, 50,000 mosques shut down, at least one million people have accepted Christ in Iran. So why? What's happening there that's different than other parts of the Islamic world? Well, I think it's what's happening there is actually representative of what's happening in, in the Islamic world. And those statistics there that were quoted in, in a blog that we had posted are not something that we came up with on our own. Those have come from 
other research and reputable news agencies that have provided that. God has opened the door for our ministry to take media presentations into Muslim countries. We do radio programs and some TV programs. Currently, for example, in the Middle East, we have three uh, Arabic dialects that we're broadcasting in. And we're seeing people who are hungry for something of purpose and substance. I believe that God has opened that door and he is working in the lives of these uh, of certain areas and populations. We've had reports of, of dreams and visions. We've had reports of, of dreams and visions. Can God give visions to people today? Yes. Does God give visions to people today? Possibly. Should we expect visions to be an ordinary occurrence? No. In the Bible, God spoke to people many times by means of dreams and visions. Examples are Joseph, son of Jacob, Joseph, the husband of Mary, Solomon, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Peter, and Paul. The prophet Joel predicted an outpouring of dreams and visions as we read in Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This was confirmed by the apostle Peter as we read in Acts 2, 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. It is important to note that the difference between a vision and a dream is that a vision is given when a person is awake, while a dream is given when a person is asleep. In areas where there is little or no gospel message available, God is taking his message to people directly through dreams and visions. This is entirely consistent with the biblical examples of dreams and visions being used by God to reveal His truth in the Old and New Testaments. If God desires to communicate His message to a person, He can use whatever means He finds necessary. A missionary, an angel, a vision, or a dream. God can also give visions in areas where the gospel message is already readily available. There is no limit to what God can do. We must be discerning when it comes to dreams and visions and the interpretation of them. We must keep in mind that the Bible is finished and it tells us everything we need to know. The key truth is that if God were to give a vision, it would agree completely with what he has already revealed in his word. Dreams and visions should never be given equal or greater authority than the word of God. God's word is our ultimate authority. If you believe you have had a vision and feel that perhaps God gave it to you, Prayerfully examine the Word of God and make sure your vision is in agreement with Scripture. Then prayerfully consider what God would have you do in response to the vision, as we read in James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God would not give a vision to a person and then keep the meaning of the vision hidden. In Scripture, whenever a person asks God, for the meaning of a vision, God made sure it was explained to the person as we read in Daniel 8, 15 through 17. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. There are many people on YouTube today that claim they have had dreams and visions from God. While there may be some who have actually had a vision from God, there are those who are attention seekers or simply deceived by Satan who have not. And as we have people responding, one of the things that I see is they are finding a value in who they are. They're also finding purpose and I think a different understanding of who God is. We get responses from listeners who say, you know, now I, I understand 
that God loves me. I always thought that God wanted to punish me. And I think there's there's a, a an awakening, as I said, that, that's taking place across the Muslim world, not just in Iran. I think Iran, there is an incredible uh, turning of, of the tide there. And sorry for that. That's not an intentional play on words there, because we actually, other than our satellite broadcasting that goes in there, we don't have anything on the ground. Well, how about but Afghanistan? It, we don't hear much it, about it, uh, Christians there, uh, Christian growth right. there, I guess, since the Taliban took over. Of course, it's extremely dangerous to leave the Islamic faith there and become a Christian. Tell us more. And that's another area where it, it's extremely difficult to get boots on the ground in. And so that's why, you know, we're beaming in and sending the gospel in on radio programs. And that's where, again, we are getting positive responses and trying our best to help connect these there with groups. It's very hard to connect listeners with others in the country because they have to basically meet as underground churches. There's a lot of suspicion of, okay, if I'm going to meet with these people and share that I'm now a believer, are they really true believers or are they um, just trying to identify me? Because, as you mentioned earlier, it's more than simply being ostracized or disowned by your family. It is actually the threat of death. So accepting new life in Christ means accepting the possibility of your life ending in this world. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is Accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready!
time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.